So if you've got a Bible, let me welcome you to turn to Psalm 51, continuing our series through this psalm and around this subject of repentance, the doctrine of repentance, the fruit of repentance, the manifestation of repentance in our life. That's going to be predominantly our theme as we take a look at the next few verses in the sequence of this song of praise, this song of penitence penned by David on the back of his own uh, gruesome, grisly, and horrifying uh, fall into sin where he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he tried to cover it up and he lied and deceived and, and, and that didn't work. We all know what that feels like when you're trying to cover your tracks because you've done something atrocious and your lies are only digging that hole all the more and vastly worse. And so David commits murder by proxy killing killing the, wife, the husband sorry, of Bathsheba, and the whole thing is a mess. And Nathan, God's prophet, comes to David, confronts him in his sin, and brings, this, brings David to this point of repentance, of penitence. And so we've been working through this psalm, which is, which is David's response to the truth of God's word, reflected on the error and the depravity of his own life. And, and we can all, I'm sure, we can all resonate with how that feels. When, when life's going a certain way and you're engaged in certain thought patterns or behaviors or, 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 or even a way in which you might use your words, and then the Bible comes and speaks truth in your circumstance, and you realize you've not been living in a way that God has required or God has commanded, and so the word brings about that repentance. So as we're working through this Psalm 51, we've, uh, we've learned and we've grown and we've been challenged. We're going to pick it up at verse 13 and take a look at these next five verses. And by God's grace, we're going to, we're going to shift a little bit in our perspective of this. And we're going to take a look at how, how repentance bears forth its fruit. How repentance bears forth its fruit. So I know... You've turned there to Psalm 51, and I want you to stay there. And let me give you two New Testament verses, just, to, just by way of, of putting a footing underneath this. It says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, these are the words of John the Baptist, who said, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. At this point in John the Baptist's life, career, and ministry of, of, his, of his prophetic calling, he had become the most enigmatic and popular teacher, rabbi, prophet in all of Israel. And John the Baptist could see that now there were Pharisees and Sadducees that were coming out to him to be baptized. And he cried out and said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. There's not even a, not even a hint of a note of political correctness or, or any kind of modern day sermonizing in that. You're a, you're a brood of vipers. And, and, and John the Baptist, his, his word to them is, don't just feign an outward form of repentance or, 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 or don't just provoke any kind of emotional response. Let your repentance bear fruit. Now I know there will be those uh, there will be some, and I've said this nearly every single week we've studied this doctrine on repentance, who believe that repentance is an old covenant concept. It's, a, it's an Old Testament, uh, uh, it, it's a legal idea that has no, real, it has no real place in the covenant of grace in the life of believers today. And I thought that if I just bring John the Baptist, it's easy, it's easy to take John the Baptist and neatly tuck him into the Old Testament, given that he is actually an Old Testament prophet. I know he appears in your New Testament, and that can be all too confusing, but he's an Old Covenant prophet preparing the way for the Messiah. So I thought, hey, let's draw upon the Apostle Paul, Acts 26, verse 20. Now this is while Paul is on trial, Acts 26 Verse 20, and Paul is going to speak about how God called him from a life of Pharisaism into the covenant of grace. And Paul talks about the way his ministry began immediately to take shape. Acts 26, 20 says this, Paul says, I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. It's much the same message we just read from the Baptist. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
repentance. In fact, I want to state it as strongly as I can right out of the gate here this evening that if our repentance doesn't produce fruit, it is of no value at all. That's the, that's the theme, the motif, if you will, that we are introduced to in these next few verses of Psalm 51. That an assurance of forgiveness on the basis of sincere repentance, that's been what we've labored over in the previous weeks, that God is ready to pour out His love, His mercy, grace, and forgiveness if our hearts and our, and our minds are ready to humbly and honestly confess and repent. An assurance of forgiveness always produces a response. So David takes us there. Psalm 51, let's pick it up at verse 13. Now, if this is your first night with us in this series, it would, it would pay you well to perhaps go home and meditate on the first 12 verses of this psalm and take a look at just how wide and vast David speaks about the repentance being a, 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 being a work of the heart. And now David goes on and he says in verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, verse 15, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifices, or, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. I've got four actions here that are produced or demonstrated from David that true, sincere, heartfelt repentance always bears these fruits. Always. So if you've been tracking with us along in this series of repentance and, and one of those niggling questions that you can't, you can't seem to satisfy or, or dismiss has been, how do I know if, if my repentance is sincere or is grounded in a true heartfelt sorrow for sin and a turning toward righteousness? How can I know? How can I know that my repentance is the true biblical thing and not some spurious counterfeit? The answer will always be, you will know it by its fruits. David begins to, begins to list them for us. We're going to take a look at, at four that I see very explicitly and clearly in the text. So at this point, David assumes he has repented before God and God has forgiven him. God has forgiven him of the atrocity of adultery, of deception, and even of murder. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace is always and drastically greater than the depth of our depravity and sin. So the first response, go back with me if you will to verse 13, is fairly simply this. That upon a discovery that forgiveness can be so readily found in the depth of God's mercy, true repentance always turns the repentant one, the penitent one, into an evangelist. Always. Always. And so that's what, that's what David says in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. David says that's what my repentance will do. It's not just about me finding hope and forgiveness and, and grace and mercy. And, and that's incredible. But the rest of your sinners can be left to your depravity and your hellish end. David wants to lead us to this idea that if we have stumbled upon this great treasure and the treasure is inexhaustible, it's eternal, it's infinite. If we've stumbled upon this treasure of the magnitude of God's mercy, how can we keep that to ourselves? David says, Lord, I'm, I'm going to repent. Lord, I've, I've messed up. I've, I, 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 I've, made a, I've made a complete mess of this whole thing, God. But if you forgive me, I'm going to tell others about it. I'm going to proclaim it. I'm going to teach transgressors your ways. I'm going to show other sinners that through God's grace and through the mercy of a loving Father, they also can receive this forgiveness. Repentance produces this fruit. 
a, an undeniable compulsion to rescue others. How insane and crazy and utterly unthinkable could it be if we could, if we could draw upon any manner of natural metaphors for this? You're in the building. The building starts to burn down. You find this one very unique fire escape. You run to it. You escape. And you don't take a second thought for the fact that there are others in the building. Do you show a true love of concern or care for the lives of others? This is a true mark of biblical repentance that you have an urging, a desiring to teach sinners God's ways and to show them the path of righteousness for God's name's sake. That is always a clear fruit of true repentance. I'm not saying that you're great at it. I'm not saying uh, that immediately you become the most gifted and eloquent and, and the most cogent and extroverted evangelist. And if you're not, well, you should really take a good long look inside your heart. You may not even be saved. I'm not saying that. I'm saying biblical repentance, according to David, always produces this urging, this desiring that you have stumbled. As I said, you have found this treasure and others must hear about it. That's what it does. To look all around you, to look right across this sin-sunken world and see that there are not millions, not hundreds of millions, there are billions today sitting in darkness. And we have this treasure, uh, uh, Paul's language is, we have this heavenly treasure now it's, been, now it's been encased and it's been enclosed in this, in this earthen vessel. That, that's me, that's you. And God has delighted to do it this way to the glory and the, and the majesty and the celebration of His name. But this is not, the gospel is not our secret to keep. The good news that God stands ready to forgive without any merit of your own, without any achievement of your own, without any payment of your own, through no effort of yours at all, God is ready to forgive all on account of Jesus. If we are truly repentant, if we've truly received this great news, we cannot, will not ever keep it to ourselves. David says, I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Charles Spurgeon had his own unique way of phrasing this. He would say it this way. He said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. It's no middle ground. Now Spurgeon wasn't implying that you're going to purchase your one-way ticket to some faraway distant land inhabited by an unreached people group. Although it's not less than that. Don't, don't, don't dismiss that. Many of us are called but perhaps haven't taken the risk to go. But Spurgeon simply and, and entirely saying this, that if there isn't in you the strong urging desire that others, others would receive this grace, what evidence could you have that you have received it at all yourself. So David shows us that. This initial, immediate fruit is to be an evangelist. It's to be a herald. It's to be a proclaimer. The undeniable compulsion to rescue others. The next thing we see in our text here in these few verses, so we see this in verse 14 and verse 15. Let's read them again. David prays, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. So the second thing we find is there is an exuberant praise and thanksgiving to God. It's almost always the case that the measure to which you, to which you assess the goodness of a gift is your response to it. And our ability to be exuberant, to, to be over the top in our adulation of God, a good God, a holy God, a merciful God, thank you, Lord, we praise you, we, we lift you up, we glorify you. David says that is always the natural fruit of sincere repentance. Not the, not the response of the one whose heart is pharisaical, the one who has the heart of a legalist that, that really does believe in their own, their own self-justifying efforts. 
They don't believe they're in debt to God one iota. They believe they've done enough, earned enough, worked enough to achieve God's righteousness, to, to achieve God's favor, and that makes Pharisees of us all. You remember Jesus told that story of the two men that came into the temple. One came in, he was a tax collector. Remember the tax collector? And he came in beaten down and, and his brow was furrowed and he was deeply vexed. And he came in and he, he bowed down and he wouldn't even lift up his face. And he, he said, oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And, the, and, and you remember the Pharisee comes in, the Pharisee proud, standing upright. Like he belongs. Is this the temple of the Lord? Well, I, as the servant of the Lord, this is where I belong. And he comes in and he, he cries out. And his prayer, the nature of it is, thank you, Lord, that I'm nothing like that rodent over there. And Jesus says only one of those men went to the house that day justified. It was the one who had a heart of praise, a heart of thanks, a heart of that deep vexation, that conviction of sin granted by the Spirit's grace can produce. And David tells us the response is a song of exuberant worship to glorify God. I will sing aloud your righteousness. Friend, friend, how can we not? How can we not? You know, there was this, there was this uh, ad campaign, and this is going back many, many years in Australia, it was like it was, it was like this commercial for um for the for the uh, the lottery. You guys have a lottery here, right? Not in Texas, but you know what I mean when I say the lottery. Uh, two of you, very the rest of you were so pious, you couldn't even for a moment fathom what could what could this pagan from this other land be talking about, right? So so there's this there's this lottery, and uh, and what it is is simply buy your buy your lottery ticket, and if your numbers that you chose come up, you might win a, a jackpot of. 30 million, 60 million, 100 million. Who knows, who knows what the amount would be? And so, and so this ad campaign to try and compel people to buy these lottery tickets was that they would, they would affix, they would, they would affix these, these secret cameras to get a glimpse of the response of the winners when they were informed that they won the lottery. And, and these ad campaigns were, and I, someone's going to write me a letter, I know. I'm not endorsing the lottery. Don't gamble. It's bad. Just get it out of the way, just so you know. But this ad campaign was, was cleverly done, and, and, and if I can be so bold to say, the commercials were actually fairly enjoyable to watch because they were just snippets and shots of people having discovered that they'd won the lottery and their exuberance was uncontainable. They would be screaming, shouting, dancing, celebrating, reveling in this earthen treasure. In this earthly treasure. Now, to be sure, it no doubt changed their life, and I'm sure it was a good day for them, but it's an earthly treasure. And you could see people that were in shopping malls, and they discovered that they won, and they didn't even stop for a moment to wonder who's looking how am I going to be perceived? How are others going to look at me and what are they going to think? People think I'm radical or I'm, I'm insane or, or I have no self-control. We do all those things when we get in here in the church. And we have not won an earthly treasure. We have, by the grace of God, in Christ's sacrifice, received. We have won, if you will permit me the poetic license to say so, in Christ an eternal, undiminishing treasure of glory. David says, David says, there's no way you find out that you've just inherited heaven and you can keep quiet about it. There, there, there's no way that there's not a compulsive response of praise and adoration. That's what it says. It says it in two different ways. It says in the first verse, in verse 14, I'll sing aloud your righteousness. And verse 15 says, my mouth will declare your praise. Thanks, praise, adoration, an audible response is always the fruit of a truly changed heart and life. Now, I'm not, please don't mishear me this evening. I'm not in any way trying to endorse a certain style of worship. I'm not saying you, you guys, you just don't sing loud enough during worship. Although I do feel that way a little bit. 
Sometimes I wonder, are we that excited? Are we that, are we that excited about what God has granted us? David says we discover that all of our sin is washed away. We discover that all of heaven's treasure has become our possession. We discover that eternal death is dismissed. Eternal life has come. We're in Christ. We are victorious more than conquerors. Peace that passes understanding. But sometimes our worship reflects nothing more than all that we've received is simply nothing other than a passive gift. David says repentance produces exuberance. I'll sing aloud your praise. I'll sing aloud. My mouth will declare. The next thing we read about in this, let's go back, just rehearse these first two. The first one, Evangelism, the undeniable compulsion to rescue others. Secondly, exuberant praise. Thirdly, not to turn aside to false religion. Not to turn aside to false religion. Never turn back to sin. Or worse, never turn back to self-righteousness. I get this from verse 16. For you would not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. What David's indicating there is that that there is an outward sacramental system that God has granted through Moses for the tabernacle that is to show the atonement that comes through God's final sacrifice sent from heaven, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. David says in this that what I'm not going to do What true, sincere repentance does not do is it doesn't turn aside and assume that there's a superficial fix for my sin or deceive myself into thinking that repentance is not an ongoing process in the Christian life. Let's deal with the first part of that as briefly as we can. So David is saying, Lord, now that I've learned of my corruption, now that I've learned of my guilt, I know you're not going to delight in sacrifice, or I would give that. I know you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. And as verse 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Sometimes there's this propensity, and we, and we see it particularly with new believers. They, they come into the church, they hear the gospel, They receive Christ, they get baptized, and the devil then truly sets at work to spoil it, to to poison it, to undermine it in some way, shape, or form with a false view of God, a false view of self, or some contamination or distortion of the gospel. This is so common. David says true repentance keeps us on that straight and narrow on the basis of God's word. David knows what God wants. And David knows what God does not want on the basis of God's revealed word. A dependence on God's revealed word. And the second half of that, as we've already seen, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. So godly repentance does not lead us off the narrow path. And godly repentance leads us to more repentance. More repentance. You don't have to respond to this, but let me just ask this rhetorically. Have you ever been, you ever been kind of moving through and, and, and on your pilgrimage of your Christian life and you've got to a point where you felt like a lot of the major battles that you fought against the sin of your life in your early Christian years, you've fairly well overcome by God's grace through the Spirit's power, no doubt. Only then to have you wake up the next day and the Holy Spirit just kind of turns his spotlight on something else in your life. And you begin to feel, you begin to reel back and say, how long have I been doing that for? How long have I thought like that for? How long have I been speaking like that? How long has that sin been in my life, God? This is the nature of the Christian life. Remember we said this on on their first ever sermon on this doctrine of repentance? 
Uh, to the great reformer Martin Luther, he said that the entire Christian life is to be lived out daily in repentance. Godly repentance produces more godly repentance. There is never a day in this world, on this pilgrimage to our celestial city of glory in heaven, there's never a day in this life that we do not need to be repenting before God for something in our life. And it only takes the Holy Spirit. One of His major functions in our life is to reveal to us and to convict us of sin and righteousness. So David says, as we read this in verse 17, and I don't want you to read verse 17, and consider that this verse is speaking exclusively about that brokenness that comes when you realize you've committed a major sin. That's when we're contrite. That's when brokenness is, dare I say it, that's when brokenness is, is easy. But David says these are the sacrifices that God requires. These are the, this is the daily pilgrimage. This is the way we should live, the way we should posture ourselves, the way our heart should be in perpetuity, that the sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. Pride ever lurks close and ready to pounce and take the advantage over us. So David says, God, you're not asking me to contribute to my salvation. You're not asking me to, to be good enough, righteous enough, worthy enough. You're asking me to be broken and contrite, to be in a state of perpetual humility, because there is always something in my life that I need to repent of. And I don't even always know what that may be. The Bible tells us that glorification, glorification is that universal experience for everyone who's in Christ that they will only receive the moment they go to glory and they shall then be changed into the image and likeness of Jesus. But in this life, repentance always produces more repentance. It always produces contrition, humility, and a readiness. God, what next? I fought that battle. It was a hard battle. I had to overcome that addiction, that sin, that weakness. Now, Lord, I feel like by your grace, I've overcome. What's next? That's the posture of the true Christian heart. All this and the, the sum of all this is simply, there's got to be a reaction. There's got to be a response. Biblical repentance is not summed up in a few short and quickly experienced tears and a moment of vexation. Biblical repentance is, is that balance of the Christian life where we are rejoicing in the revelry of celebration that God has been good to us. But we are contrite and in our hearts we are humble knowing that all that we have has been given us sheer by the sheer gift of God. Repentance is all about what's produced. Bear fruit in keeping with your repentance. And never be satisfied until repentance has done its full work in you. One last verse. Revelation chapter 2, verse In the first of these seven epistles that Jesus sends through the Apostle John to the churches of Asia Minor, the first church being Ephesus. This is Revelation 2 verse 4. We pick it up midway through the, the letter of Jesus to these believers. And Jesus says this, But I have this against you that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Verse 5, Jesus said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The, the Ephesian church, these are seasoned believers. These are, for many of them, lifelong Christians. At about the point that this epistle is written, somewhere in the early AD 90s, the Ephesian church has been in existence for somewhere around about 40 years. And the Ephesian church has had the, the cream of the crop. 
They've, they've had, the, they've had the, the roster call of the greatest ministers of that era come through the Ephesian church to preach. John the Apostle had been the pastor of the Ephesian church for some time. We know Paul made several visits to the Ephesian church to minister to them and to bless them. We know that Paul wrote his epistle to the Ephesians. We know that Paul sent Timothy, his son in the faith, to be the the pastor of the Ephesian church and subsequently wrote two more epistles to the church via Timothy. We think of the three epistles in the New Testament that are given to John. John 1, John 2, John 3. They're all written with some degree of certainty to the Ephesian church. Other notable mentions, Apollos, Aquila, Priscilla, they all had their time at the Ephesian church. If there was ever a church that had no excuse to be plummeting into depravity and lukewarmness and the illness of pride and sin, it should be this church. But here is Jesus writing to them some decades on, and he says to them, You've abandoned your first love. You've given it up. You've grown cold. Your first love was a fervent love. It was a a zealous love, but you've grown cold. What do you suspect Jesus would prescribe to them? Now, we've just read it, so you don't have to to guess too hard here. But just by way of a thought experiment, what do you suspect many modern celebrity preachers might say to that church? What What might they advise if a church's love has grown cold? A church that had every advantage. A church that had every distinct and glorious gift that God could give. There is not a church in the New Testament that had as much scripture written to it than the Ephesian church. There just simply isn't. What does Jesus say? Does he say find a quiet place somewhere, sit down and Try and conjure up, try and, try and generate that, that first love that you used to have. Try and stoke it and stir it and kindle it. Try and, try and get it going again. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say go back to your, your old thinking and your old ways and remember the old sermons you heard and those old letters. Bring them out and, and read them again and see if, they can't, see if they can't stir up in you this first love. I love what Jesus prescribes. Firstly, he mentions twice repentance. He says, repent, and at the end of verse 5, he says, unless you repent, your lampstand shall be removed from its place. It's, it's cryptic language that's meant to mean the church will be snuffed out of existence. And Jesus threatens that to the majority of these churches. What's Jesus' prescription? Beyond just repent, we know it's repent. But what specifically, he says, do the works you did at first. I wonder how much trouble I'll get in for saying this, that we, we evangelicals tend to have a phobia of that word, don't we? Works. We, we zealously defend the, the great Reformation doctrine of justification by faith alone. Sola fide, and so we should. We We passionately stand firm on the conviction that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, not according to works, lest anyone should boast. That is the mantra of our confession, and it should be. Sometimes we develop this phobia of works. Sometimes we do. Jesus says to the Ephesian church, you've left your first love, you need to repent. And just in case you're wondering, what does that repentance look like? It looks like you getting out there and zealously being active in the gospel cause for my name's sake. Repentance bears fruit. Let us never be satisfied, not in ourselves and never in others, with repentance that's nothing more than an emotional engagement and reaction. If it does not bear fruit, then lampstands are removed from their place. Do the work she did at first. I wonder while we're thinking on this tonight, and we will look to close out, I wonder if there are any here tonight. You, you remember your first love. You remember 
That zeal, that energy, that enthusiasm that, that accompanied your early confessions of Christ. And if Jesus could come down right now and speak to you and ask you the question, have you, have you grown in fervency? Has your zeal taken on a, a more mature hue? Has your, has your energy and your enthusiasm only increased in Christ's likeness? Or have you grown cold? Have you left your first love? This is why the Christian life is in an entire life of repentance. I don't know that there truly would be anyone here that would say, that fervor that I had when I first came to Christ has only increased today. I'm even willing to say to you myself that I can see in my own life ways in which that early energy of my receiving Jesus begins to wane. And there is a sense, don't misunderstand me, where which that, that energy begins to mature. It, became, it, it starts to get more informed by Scripture and the way that we should conduct ourselves. I'm, I'm, I'm stoutly embarrassed by some of the things I said and did when I first came to faith because I knew nothing. But the zeal, the love, that first love, that, that white hot love, Jesus would say to us, your repentance must bear fruit. Repent, which means in the words of Christ, do the works you did at first. Be proactive in your repentance. Don't settle down and find a quiet corner and weep your tears of solemnity and sorrow and get up and say, my repentance is done. It's not even started to be done until you're doing. Until you're acting and performing the works that are commanded us in the Scripture to the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always remembering this. I'm going to read verse 17, then we'll close. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. The right response, friend, to all of this is not throw your hands in the air and give up. It's not get frustrated and pull out. It's to deepen your conviction, your contriteness, your brokenness, and know that God will never, ever reject the humble heart. The proud He will. The Bible says the proud God rejects gladly. But the humble God draws near to and grants ever-increasing measure of grace. Let's go to that Lord together right now in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your grace, Your sweet, Your glorious Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, the Holy Spirit is given to us that it might reveal to us our sin, our corruption, and our need of further repentance. But Father, I, I, I believe the burden of this passage right here that we've shared tonight in Psalm 51 is not to allow our repentance to be an emotional response only, but that it ought to bear fruit, that it ought to provoke action. And here's my concern, God, that so often we use that word repentance as, as simply nothing more than, than simply a, a change or a state in our emotional response to something. And Lord, I know, we know, it is, certainly is that, but it's so much more than that. I pray the words that, Father, that your son Jesus shared to that Ephesian church would settle right into our hearts. Have we left our first love? Have we given up the great Christian plights of repentance? Have we quit on that and moved on to other things that we, that we thought were more mature and more holy and more in keeping with our progress in grace? God, we repent of that. Forgive us of that. Help our repentance to produce a zeal for evangelism. Help our repentance produce a zeal for praise and worship. Help our repentance produce in us greater contrition and a burden of humility. God, we ask all these things that you would be glorified. For Jesus has come into this world and died on that cruel cross, shed his innocent blood to forgive us sinners. And after rising from the grave in victory and triumph, he calls us to himself with this word, repent. Repent. God, we give you great thanks for the privilege of repentance. We give you great thanks for the Spirit's grace to empower our repentance.
And we ask that we would be faithful to give you all the glory and honor due to your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.